Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today, and especially on this holiday week. We certainly appreciate your attendance. My name is Adam, Marketing Specialist with Henry Schein, and I'll be your moderator. Today, we are joined by Dr. Jason Mann, who will discuss CBCT in the general practice, as well as review four case studies. If you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the Q&A section of your control panel, and we'll cover them at the end. No CE credits are being offered for viewing or attending this presentation. As I mentioned, our speaker today is Dr. Jason Mann. Dr. Mann specializes in cosmetic and implant dentistry and is the lead dentist at Providence Dental Spa in Rhode Island. Dr. Mann, we're all looking forward to your presentation. Thanks for being with us. Thank you so much, Adam. I appreciate that. I'll uh, correct a couple of things. Uh, I'm not in Rhode Island. I'm in Macon, Georgia, in uh, about an hour south of Atlanta. So it's, it's funny that uh, some people will get me confused with Rhode Island. So. That's that's my bad. I saw the Providence and I attributed to Rhode Island. No, no that's fine. That's fine. But well, uh, I just wanted to thank everybody for joining me today and wanted to go over a little information, background information, but um, but also wanted to address everything that um, everything that's presented in this presentation is purely my views, my opinions, uh, and nothing is expressed or on behalf of Henry Schein. Um, you'll also see some of the uh, some of the technology in my slides that are from Densply Serona, just because I've been immersed with Densply Serona for uh, a little over a decade now. And so we've got a lot of their technology. So if you do see that, it's uh, just because I have that within my practice. So uh, a little background information about me. Uh, I graduated from MCG back in 2007, um, did a, uh, did a maxi course for implant placements and then IV sedation course after that. Um, and since then I was in a group practice for about four years and decided I wanted to do something a little different. So I broke off and did something my own and started Providence Dental Spa in Macon, Georgia in 2011 from scratch. And um, I knew I wanted to do something that wanted to set myself apart. And um, I, was, I was really interested in cosmetic and implant dentistry, but also uh, problem focused, problem focused practice around uh, pathology and, and really pain associated with um, areas that I, I just, especially when you get two, dimen two dimensional x-rays that you really can't pinpoint where it's coming from. So, and that's kind of where I started and how I started my practice. And, and so saying that is where we actually grew in middle Georgia, because I wanted to do something outside of Atlanta. But to go into um, to go into a little uh, little background here, let me see if I can. There you go. Um, what we're going to be talking about in this lecture here is really around uh, the implementation of the CBCT and, and finding out if it's really right for you. Uh, we'll go over four case studies um, around pathology, endo, oral surgery, and implantology, and really focus it in on the dy dynamics within the practice and seeing how it can uh, bring revenue and also bring, bring awareness, uh, not only for your clinical team, but also for your patient base as well. So some of the things that we wanna look at throughout this, um, throughout this demonstration or presentation is really around the cost of the equipment um, and the space supporting this, uh, patient base and also the commitment to continuing education. And around this right here is what I want to, uh, at the end of the uh, presentation is really drive home is their commitment to this technology and, and making sure that this is something that you really wanna focus in on because it's, uh, as you know, it's the price of a CBCT, it, even though it's coming down, it's still fairly cost, uh, uh, cost intensive. And so depending on what you're looking for, what you're trying to, accomplish what should determine the type of CT that you're looking for. And really around understanding the technology of CBCT, uh, understanding what you're trying to accomplish in what field, or are you primarily an endo or a GP or oral surgery, um, and finding if what CBCT is right for you. And the biggest thing around CBCT is understanding the head and neck anatomy um, and knowing when to refer out, when to implement a dental radiologist 
uh, to send off to oral and maxillofacial surgery, surgery or uh, over in your medical counterpart. And utilizing the CBCT to really develop your treatment planning and techniques and, and patient education, like I was telling you before, because this is, it's not only, not only a, uh, a amazing tool to, to look at and decide what treatments need to be rendered, but it gives you the ability to better educate that patient and, and feel more comfortable around uh, treatment planning when you can see things in a three-dimensional image. Uh, and also developing the CBCT uh, technology and, and enforcing it, not enforcing it, but uh, trying to empower your team is really around how you train your team to implement the CBCT and un making sure they understand image quality and utilization. Uh, and lastly, around the, the marketing around your practice will ultimately develop into uh, internal and external marketing. So if we start diving in and really looking at whether a CBCT is right for you, do your research on your CBCT. You know, there are so many different fields of use. There are five by fives and they go up to, I believe, a 13 by 17 um, and really depends on if what I start seeing is endo is a lot more specific. Um, so smaller the field of view, a little bit better, uh, better diagnostics that you will get. So I see a lot of endodontists that will get a limited field of view around a five by five, uh, looking at one tooth at a time. Um, a lot of GPs will get the 11 by 13 that will end up uh, getting close to the condyle. And then some of the uh, larger CBCTs that you'll see more in the ma uh, oral and maxillofacial, uh, getting it to the 13 by 17, I believe. So some of the things that you wanna pay attention to is cost. As you start looking at CBCT, uh, look at the cost investment associated with it. The, you know, the, there are some CBCTs out there. Um, once you start doing the research, you'll start seeing that, okay, well, this may be, may be a little bit more cost effective, but look about the support, look at the longevity of the CBCT and also reach out to some of your colleagues that may have one and finding out if this is something that you want to um, take a dive into. And also footprint, looking in your office to see uh, where the CBCT can be placed. Even though some of these CBCTs out there are upgradable where you can get a pan. And so if you haven't decided whether you want to get into uh, three-dimensional imaging yet, but look at the 2D imaging where you may have an upgradable version of that. Um, I know there's some talks about it may not give you exactly the same image, uh, but it's a, a good way to not pigeonhole yourself into not having that ability for a CBCT. And so around this footprint, uh, some of the CBCTs will require quite a large room a lot of these rooms will have to be lead lined, so you'll need to make sure that you uh, contact your contractor to see if this is something that you'll have to do some additional demo uh, in your office, or it may be uh, constraining you to a certain uh, manufacturer for that CBCT. Uh, and around IT utilization, and so in my office, we have to have additional servers for our CBCT. We do have two CBCTs in our practice. Um, and with this, what you'll start noticing is more often you take these CBCTs, more often you're starting to upgrade your, your memory, uh, probably once a year. It's not that much. Um, it probably costs us maybe 120 or $180 once a year to upgrade the memory, uh, because of how many CBCTs we take. Uh, so just make sure you keep that in mind. If you do have an IT company that you currently work with reach out to them and make sure that uh, the servers that you're getting are not going to be bogged down to a point of where you're having to continuously upgrade the, your system. Uh, and we talked about a little bit about field of use that I'll, I'll show you in just a second here, but also looking at um, integration with the other technologies. Um, as you know, that with Serona that, that I have, uh, we do have a lot of integrated technologies where we can uh, take our intraoral scanner, our prime scan, Omnicam, whichever one you may have, um, and merge it over to our CBCT and do our virtual diagnostic wax up so that we can plan for implant placements 
and give us a better understanding and a better utilization for treatment planning for our patients. Um, but also primarily around collaborative care, not only with your fellow colleagues, but also with your specialists. Uh, and you'll start noticing that some of the um, some of the some of your colleagues, especially in the medical field, will start reaching out to you, asking for your services as well, uh, since they know you have a CBCT. Because um, we primarily would see a lot in plastics and ENT uh, of having uh, mutual patients that are involved in um, CBCTs for them to evaluate. Um, so here's around your field of view that I was talking about. So if you look at your small field of view, uh, primarily around endo, endodontists tend to look at this uh, quite often. Uh, they're looking at quadrant dentistry. Um, you'll, you'll, need to, you'll need to end up doing four of these scans in order to get a full arch, upper and lower arch. If you are looking at something where you want to get upper and lower dentition, you may be looking at the eight by eight, but understand that you're not getting the angle of the mandible, you're not getting the condyles. That's when you're getting into that 10, 10 by 11, that third, that third picture right there. You'll start seeing some of the condyles, depending on your larger adults, it may not get down back to the condyles. It'll get part of um, the, the inferior border of the maxillary sinus, uh, but that's and sometimes on some patients that may get the inferior rim of the orbit. But not until you get to the 13 by 17 um, will you start getting to the superior uh, rim of the orbit, uh, get all your anatomical structures. This is primarily used in uh, a lot of um, oral and maxillofacial offices. Um, so, uh, you start noticing some GPs are starting to get these 11 by uh, 17, excuse me, 13 by 17s. Uh, in my practice, I have the third one, the 10 by 11. I find that it, it does what we need to do, um, especially around uh, diagnosis of any dental related uh, issues, but also getting back to the condyle uh, quite frequently. So the other thing, this kind of gives you an idea of what the large field of view will look like. So if you start looking at this, that's why I, what we're talking about around paying attention to the anatomy, knowing your head and neck anatomy, because uh, this is going to be completely different than your panoramic x-ray, because as you start scrolling um, anterior posteriorly, you start picking up a lot of areas, and I know that that becomes a hot topic around, uh, all right, well, if I'm getting a CPCT, am I referring everything out to dental radiology, um, and what, what do I want to kind of focus in on within my practice in order to provide that care for that patient, so um, my, my philosophy is, you know, uh, I, I want to try to provide the best service for that patient. I want to uh, provide some technology to allow me to be a better clinician. So this field of view for me and my practice is maybe a little much. I'm, I don't need as much, uh, as much as this information that's presented on the screen. So around the usage of um, CBCT that we use within our practice itself, especially around implant dentistry. Uh, we're, when we're looking at implant dentistry, uh, we're looking at trying to determine whether we have adequate bone structure, uh, whether we need bone augmentation and also evaluating the vital structures. So with this right here is when we're planning our implant placements, it's nice to be able to look at the bone, whether you're plan placing implants or you're sending it out to the specialist, um, we use it as a huge tool so that we could show patients and virtually place implants into the software and show patients that whether they have enough bone or do not have enough bone, whether they need a sinus augmentation or um, this may be not a really good area for implant placement due to um, the, the atrophy of the bone of the supporting uh, sup the adjacent teeth. So with this, the patient really has the ability to look at things in three dimensions, but it also gives us uh, an ability to know when we start opening up uh, the tissue for implant placement, whether we have enough bone as opposed to doing bone sounding. So we know the last thing that we want to get into is opening up that patient and find out, you know, Mrs. Jones, I'm sorry, um, we're gonna need some extra bone or we cannot do this unless we do a sinus lift. Now the 
now the ability for that patient to really find confidence in what we're saying from that point on it has really diminished significantly. So that is something that I love using and making sure the patient understands. And, and also when we refer, when we do refer some cases to specialists, um, that the patient is aware and they're ready to go as far as understanding the, the process of everything, but also understanding uh, the cost associated with it. Because the last thing I want to do is send the patient off to the specialist and say that they need an implant and then find out that, well, not only do they need implant, they need bone augmentation, they need sinus lift. Uh, and that by that time, the patient has really just kind of been discouraged and decided that they don't want to go forward with that treatment. Um, then the next, next point is around oral surgery, uh, specifically around the evaluation of root structures to the, uh, around the roots to vital structures around the inferior velar, uh, around sinus cavities. And what's, what you'll start noticing is it's amazing to see how close these roots are to the, uh, to the sinus cavity itself. And and how the sinuses are actually dropping down in between the root structures um, on the maxillary arch. And so what you'll end up seeing is um, knowing that, okay, well, if we have a lot, of, uh, a lot of decay on this tooth, maybe we want to section this tooth, or maybe this root has uh, fused together on that mesial buckle where, you know, um, it has fused to the, the distal buckle as well. So that if, if we end up sectioning this tooth, we know that we're going to be sectioning mesial distally and not sectioning in three areas. Because the last thing you want to get into is trying to section that mesial and distal root uh, on the buccal aspect and find out that those, area, those two roots are fused or has a fin between them that you'll never end up getting. So it gives you the ability to have this uh, security of knowing going into oral surgery and knowing how you're going to end up sectioning these roots, um, especially around sinus perforations as well. Knowing that if you're digging for a root, uh, making sure you have enough bone apically to that uh, root before you start digging into it. Um, and knowing that if you do get into it, um, that way you know where it is in the sinus cavity if you have to go in after it. So that gives you the, also the ability to know um, when, it, Worst case scenario, you do push a root up into the sinus, you know, you can take a CBCT and have it sent off to um, the uh, specialist for uh, retrieving them. Endodontics, especially around evaluation of multiple roots, calcifications and blockages. Uh, and the last part is the internal external resorption. And so a lot of times we will, uh, you can't really tell whether it's on the buccal or palatal or how far it is within the nerve, within the internal structure or internal root structure of that tooth, of, the, uh, of that tooth. Where, where we wanna pay attention to is if it starts perforating the, the exterior of that tooth and is it starting creating a periodontal defect. And so one of the things that we look at with that CBCT is take things in slices so that we can show the patient how far up and uh, so they understand especially around resorption of whether that tooth can be salvageable or not. Because the last thing we wanna do is to give them a, a potential a diagnosis that they can't really grasp or really don't know until that tooth breaks off. But the time, at that time, it's really too late. Um, and it's just a lot more work that has to go into it. And if that does happen, at least that patient knows that you did have that technology, did show them those things. So it gives them more reassurance that um, you have uh, the ability to continue proceeding with uh, other care. So especially around pathology, bony pathology not associated with teeth, you know, a lot of times, depending on the size of um, the size of the CT, you may end up picking up some of the carotid plaques, even though that we are not um, able to diagnose those, but especially picking up those and, and getting them over to their medical counterpart to see if this is something that um, they really need to look at. And, and we've had uh, probably on a monthly basis uh, in, in a couple of our locations that we'll see these carotid plaques, we'll work with medical and they'll go and do echoes and, and find out that 
A lot of them are very minute, are very minor. Uh, others a little bit bigger. I've seen them, you know, probably, uh, probably about uh, one's maybe a half inch long um, bilaterally. And, you know, some of these patients are asymptomatic and don't know it. And so even if you had the ability to um, save one life that way, uh, in my eyes, it's always been worth it. Um, and also some of the things that we have noticed through pathology is the communication between the external, uh, internal, external environments. Um, there are a lot of, we had one uh, not too long ago where the lady came back from dermatology, um, but had almost like a little um, pimple on the side of her face that would never heal. And we ended up finding out that it was coming uh, from a lesion inside the jaw. She's still in treatment right now. Um, but is actually coming from a lesion inside the jaw. So once we took a CBCT, we can actually see the uh, little fistula strap going through that soft tissue out to the external environment and, and, and getting that patient over to um, the, the proper clinician to be able to uh, treat her. Um, and direct restorations. Looking, uh, a lot of people uh, will look at this and we've done a couple cases already around on extractive teeth to see how, how close that dental decay is on the CBCT in relation to the alveolar structure. So you'll see a lot of these class five lesions that are kind of hidden around up underneath the gum tissue. And a lot of times you really don't know how far they are until you get in there and start removing gum tissue. And it's, it's really nice looking at this to see how close it is to the alveolar crest and showing that patient again, of, of getting them educated about um, biologic width and showing them how close it is so that they understand in the event that you were to get in there, uh, you don't have to worry about, um, you know, giving them false hopes around uh, longevity of that tooth uh, and gives you peace of mind knowing that when you're going in there, uh, you know how close you are to the alveolar structure. Uh, and lastly, like I said, you know, I, I do have uh, the technology you see here on the screen um, is really around the CAD CAM integration to CBCT and, and, and getting things uh, fabricated where you can merge the data from a uh, intraoral scanner going all the way to a CBCT, uh, doing your virtual diagnostic wax up, planning a surgical guide, having it either uh, milled out or printed out for implant dentistry and, and utilizing that workflow has just been tremendously valuable in our practice. So uh, the first case presentation that I wanna go over is um, this, this patient right here. She was a 48 year old female that presented uh, to our office looking at implants on the uh, lower canine positions. And she was congenitally missing her maxillaterals as well. And once we started looking at this, we of course took our scan and we were going through this and you know, ultimately found out that she didn't have space for that. But going through our diagnostic review, one of the things that we really picked up on is an area that she was not even coming in for. Um, and it, once we were doing our evaluation, our scan, we started looking around this number two and noticed this huge, huge cyst up in the maxillary sinus. Um, and then further question the patient, we ended up finding out that this patient uh, had this root canal probably 20 years. And for the past 10 years, uh, she's been having chronic cytositis, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of congestion previously uh, on the right side, uh, continuously going to the doctor, continuously being on antibiotics and finding out that it was coming from a missed MB2 on this uh, maxillary second molar. Um, at that time, there was a huge periodontal defect on the distal side of that. We referred her over to oral maxillofacial surgery. Um, they took out one and two, cleaned up the sinus, took out cysts, biopsy cysts, everything came back associated with a failed root canal uh, number two. Uh, and since then, everything has been, been great. Uh, she hasn't had any more problems. Um, and this was just a, a testament uh, to the CBCT, knowing having that ability to look at all the different things that we ended up seeing on this patient and finding out 
something completely different than what she came in with and, and knowing how to send that patient off to the, the, uh, the proper clinician. So um, the, the second case I want to kind of dive into a little bit is around endo. And so this, this case right here, um, this was back when we were doing, uh, I was doing molar endo and I, just to give you a little background, um, this was probably the case that made me stop doing molar endo as um, we took a, took a PA and the, the patient was in pain. So we uh, opened it up and after we got this opened up, we ended up finding six canals in this tooth. And uh, this was one that, um, you know, hindsight 2020 looking back in, um, I uh, probably would have uh, paid more attention to the CBCT look at, at this and evaluate it. This is the point in which I started really focusing in on the CBCT, looking at uh, the nerve canals and seeing how, how many nerves they are. So this one actually had six canals. There were two palatal canals. There was one distal. There's MB1, MB2, and MB in between palatal and MB2. So, um, and so, like I said, this was the one that really kind of uh, got me out of molar endo a long time ago. Um, but this is something that, like I said, is uh, especially if you're doing a lot of endo, uh, looking at uh, this ability to uh, get down and look at how many nerve canals, whether they're calcifications, where the nerves are actually joining, where they're coming out of the, potentially coming out of the apex. Um, the image on the right, this is, uh, please forgive that image quality. That was a little blurry, um, but that was the only one that I could find on this, uh, on this case right here. Um, but as you can tell, once you get down to that five by five, you will have a lot more quality of the image uh, on the right side was um, the uh, first CBCT that I had uh, when I bought it back in 2011. So. Um, image quality has increased significantly since then. Um, so that is, um, so the, the oral surgery case presentation that I want to talk to you about as well is around this patient that came into our practice, uh, actually not too long ago, she came in for this lower left wisdom tooth pain. And we were, we were going to, um, uh, allow our oral surgeon to end up taking it out and, after we, uh, after we started looking at it, uh, we can see on the pan that we can see the roots are going down to the inferior border of the uh, mandibular arch, but we just didn't know how far it was. We knew that patient was in pain, but we just did not know, you know how invasive this would be until we started evaluating the CPCT. And then upon evaluation, you can actually see on the left image where the roots had actually curved back distally and the nerve canal is coming lingual to that tooth, as you can see on that right picture right there. And you can see it's not compressing it completely, but this is not something that I want to uh, be able to start performing in my practice here. So we ended up uh, referring it out to a, uh, another oral surgeon so that they can take care of this tooth, whether they're going to end up um, cutting the clinical crown off and, and leaving the roots or whatever decision they decide. But this was something that we wanted to especially educate this patient about uh, and have the ability to send off to our oral surgeon um, so that they can really case plan this uh, situation so that when they go in, they know what they're getting into before they, um, before they actually get into the case. Um, and so this is why it's so important, especially through the communication between your team and your office and also to the oral surgeon, in this case, is having the ability to review these uh, cases before the patients get in. So one, it doesn't waste the patient's time. Two, um, the patient is knowing what to expect. And, and three is educating yourself because the oral surgeon can give you a lot of tidbits of how to discuss these cases with the patient, what, what the expectations are. So you can really set them up for success, um, especially when they are starting to get referred out to uh, the specialist. So the, the last case right here is our uh, implantology case. So uh, this 
this patient came in. Uh, he was 61 year old male presented to the office. Uh, these implants um, uh, were placed uh, within a year of this image that was taken. Um, to give you a, a little back history of this patient, he had um, a full dentition up top, was periodontally involved. Um, we, at the time, um, we were not placing multiple implants. This was many years ago. Uh, we referred out to a specialist. They went in, placed the implants, came back to the practice. Um, we converted them to a overdenture and he was doing fine. Um, and then we ended up uh, taking this image and finding out uh, around these implants. And you can actually see uh, where this implant was actually placed. Um, unbeknownst to the surgeon, you know, they did not have the, um, the capabilities of having a CBCT at their practice. Um, and so this is something that uh, it, it's really great to have and understand when patients are coming in and complaining about pain around implants um, and pain associated uh, to the supporting structures and also around implant surgery if you're considering placing implants or are placing implants, of uh, knowing angulations of these implants to be placed and uh, especially if you're making surgical guides. But, uh, but in this case right here, it gives a, a, a true representation of uh, implants being placed uh, some in bone and some out of bone, even though we had local success, uh, eventually these all four implants ended up failing and uh, ultimately had to be removed. And uh, we ended up going back with a guided surgery uh, on a full arch restoration that is uh, screw retained on this patient. So um, one of the things, um, like I was saying, that we want to talk about is when to refer out to um, radiology. Uh, the, the, making sure that you know what to refer, when to refer is really, if, if you don't know what you're looking at, refer it out, reach out to your oral maxillofacial radiologist, reach out to an oral surgeon, reach out to your ENT, uh, become, become colleagues with them, friends with them, and, and they can not only um, give you some insight, but also uh, gain your knowledge on the anatomical structures, but also furthering your education through continuing education uh, and getting better at this. But, but really around becoming that better clinician to, to have this technology so that you know what you're looking at and when to refer out. But some of the most common things that we end up referring out to all of my facial radiology is uh, atypical facial pain. It's really uh, where we just cannot diagnose anything that's going on. And uh, we just wanted that second opinion because we've, we're stumped. And the last thing we wanna do is when we send off to medical is for us to overlook something that, um, that could have been found early on. Um, a lot of times when we do this, there is a charge associated uh, with referring these patients out uh, that the patient usually picks up. So, um, Abnormal anatomical structures that really can be accounted for bilateral expansions or even unilateral expansions. Um, so those things that you just want to make sure that whenever you're referring out to oral maxillofacial radiology, you're you're working in conjunction with your oral maxillofacial surgeon, um, so that they can continue care with that case. Because, you know, like I said, once you start referring these patients out, you always want to make sure that you follow that patient through um, so that it's not dropped into this uh, quote unquote uh, black box and you just don't know where that patient's gonna end up. Um, but that's why it's so so important that you continue that communication with the specialist and communication with that uh, oral surgeon or the oral maxillofacial radiologist. Um, also around things that we found in our practice uh, around previous dental surgeries that if you see a lot of these full arch cases, implant cases, whether they're done here locally um, in the States or, or abroad, um, and we just want to have a, a clean slate and have uh, the oral maxillofacial surgeon, excuse me, the radiologist um, to evaluate this so that we know that going forward, 
uh, we're not missing anything because there's a, it could be a lot of artifacts in the image that they can clean up. Um, there may be something hidden in there that we're not seeing. Um, and so as you it just depends on your skill level that you're entering into this um, and, and your comfort zone. So if you're, you're uh, fairly new, feel free to reach out to them. Feel free to uh, bounce things off their, uh, off their minds um, because that's one of the biggest things that you'll start noticing is they're, they're willing to talk, they're willing to help you out. And so they, it's kind of like um, when, when patients, when, when the orthodontist will start looking at uh, that you're starting to do ortho, you're starting to look at these cases more often. And so it starts sending the, the orthodontist more cases. Same thing with this is, you start to pay attention to pathology more and you start engaging into oral maxillofacial radiology more and oral surgery more. And so they're, they're really enjoying having that collaborative care because not only do you have that collaborative care, but you're providing that better service to that patient. And that's what our ultimate goal is. And lastly, of course, facial trauma, um, especially around uh, patients that come in from facial trauma, we've had cases come in from plastic surgery, ENT, where they've had facial trauma and there were a, uh, a mutual patient where we end up scanning for them, but we'll still send them out to oral and actual facial radiology for them to read it for the, for the surgeon. Um, and when we, when we talking about uh, CBCT is we really want to focus in on educating our team. Uh, when we have the CBCT, it's, you know, if you're going in there, taking the image and just taking the image just to take an image and hope that it gives you something back and hope that this is some miraculous machine that, um, that no matter, as long as you hit the button, it's gonna produce an image of high quality, it, it's completely false. So it, some of the biggest things is uh, making sure that the patient can actually fit in the machine. The other thing is making sure that they're stable. There's, once you start looking at these machines of trying to find out which one's right for you, there are some machines that you can actually sit down in, some that you have to stand up, but uh, a lot of them uh, you will find that tend to be confined or, or start hitting the, the shoulders of these patients as you tend to spin the, the image around. Um, that will be one of the areas where you will get some distortion in the image itself. Uh, but also around uh, people that have a lot of um, hairs and buns that tend to get wrapped around or even bump the uh, sensor as it tends to come around their head. Um, so really having the team to pay attention to detail, uh, doing a scout image or spinning the head of the machine around to make sure it clears the patient so that they're only getting scanned once. Um, and, under, and making sure the team understands what a good quality image looks like. Even though uh, with the digital technology, you can, you can edit the image a little bit, uh, but you don't want to rely completely on that and always want to be as consistent as possible with your team. Uh, continuing education with your team. Uh, get them involved in, in uh, this continuing ed of, uh, of how much radiation that actually produces because that's one of the biggest things that patients will actually come out and ask and depending on the system that you get you can actually have an answer for that uh, everything is digital of course it's more than a traditional uh, dental uh, digital x-ray or, or digital pan but it gives the ability to quantify that uh, that dosage to that patient and especially relating it to you know uh, everyday activities and comparing a cbct uh, to a average flight in the airplane. And, you know, because a lot of people don't think about how much radiation you would get in an airplane, but every, all of us still take flights. And so when you're comparing that to a patient, then they can actually uh, absorb that a little bit better and understand that a little bit better as opposed to uh, give them, uh, getting down too technical itself. So, the, and thirdly, is, is team participation with the evaluation of the images. So whether, whether they're another doc or the assistant or hygienist, it's, it's nice for them to participate in, through the evaluation and so that they can see what you're seeing. So they understand it and, and feel ownership as well of how they can interpret a three-dimensional image when a lot of patients will come in and even, uh, even in different fields, 
not have that ability and they can actually navigate through the images after you end up leaving and diagnosing the patient when they have further questions around you know, uh, lack of bone or, or, or failing implant or, or failing root canal, the team can actually navigate the software uh, and show them in detail because after you leave the room going to another patient, that's just more reinforcement you, your team has. So definitely empower your team, definitely educate your team in order to provide that uh, for your patients. And also coding properly for images. Um, depending on your practice itself, you may decide that you want to uh, code for just panoramic images itself, or you want to code for CBCTs associated when you're doing uh, only implant placements. So that's just something you need to focus in on and decide in your philosophy uh, and what you want to do within your practice itself. So educating patients. Um, that's why I love using the CBCT is really around the education of patients because they can see everything in three dimensions, especially when they come in with tooth fractures. If they have a vertical tooth fracture and I can, uh, and I can scroll in buccal lingual and show them that periodontal defect or, or sometimes even see a palatal cusp fracture where it fractures on the occlusal surface and actually fractures out to the palatal wall and show them that fracture. Um, it depends, like I said, it depends on the image quality and the, and the system that you get. Um, so smaller field of view tends to show fractures a little easier uh, than larger field of views. So if you are uh, really, you're really focused in on an upper right quadrant and you know almost, uh, almost positively that that's where it's at, then you do have an option to reduce your image size to just concentrate in that area to potentially show a fracture. Um, and when we talk in, uh, to patients in our general practice uh, around endo, where we have multiple nerves, and when patients will come to you and say, doc, why, why won't you do this root canal? It's you know, tooth closer to the front. I know in the back, you sent me to a specialist, but this is a little bit closer to the front. And then once you pull up the CBCT and showing them where not only does this not have one nerve canal, this actually has three nerve canals and one of them are actually merging together and showing them in detail this and, and educating that patient so they understand why you're sending that patient out, why you're not doing it yourself. So that's something that you really want to focus in on and engaging that patient. And also around absence of bone, um, you know, around implant placements like we were talking about before, um, it, when, when we're placing this implant or we're trying to place this implant and educating them to show where this platform of the implant, because we can put implant and bone wherever, but the implant needs to be set at this certain height. And if we cannot set it at a height without grafting bone around it or doing bone graft ahead of time, then it looks like a fake tooth. And that's what we ultimately want to, uh, to get away from is just filling in the space, but creating an opportunity for that patient to understand where that implant actually needs to be placed and how we can restore it properly. Uh, vital structures, and like we're talking about uh, third molar removal, looking at the inferior alveolar or, or sinus cavity, uh, making sure that you stay away from those vital structures if you're not comfortable with them, and, and understanding if they do, if complications do arise, where the proximity is, and knowing how to address those. And also around the uh, adjacent supporting teeth. Um, the, the beauty around this is, you know, if a patient is uh, not able to get an implant, but all of a sudden they, you can actually show in the CBCT that not only can they not get an implant, but unbeknownst to you through the CBCT, you're seeing some percation involvement um, to the adjacent teeth. So now you start getting, uh, getting more data for that patient to, dis to educate them of uh, what they have to do as far as the next steps. Um, and talking about pathology, as we discussed earlier, is making sure that patient is very, very well educated and understanding why we're referring those patients out. And because of the image and showing them the difference between a 2D image and a 3D image to really empower them. And there's not a day that doesn't go by that uh, new patients as well as existing patients are just amazed with the technology of how you can actually show their, their uh, teeth their bone structure in three dimensions and spin it around and that, for them to actually grasp it and, and see that that is extremely powerful. So um, 
and like I was saying in treatment planning is, is really making sure that they understand and, and, and making sure that this is reinforced and utilizing this as a tool for your treatment plan presentation. Uh, and so that the patient can actually understand what to, what to uh, move forward with. Um, because it, like I said earlier, it's a lot easier to tell that patient that, the, that you need a bone graft, you need sinus augmentation, as opposed to you know, I'm sending you to the periodontist or oral surgeon for an implant placement. And it, it's a lot nicer for them to have that opportunity so that you can actually see your success level rise. So lastly, that I want to talk about is around marketing. So the one area that as you get a CBCT, um, you'll start seeing your, the potential of your business grow through external and internal marketing. Uh, external marketing, working with your social media platform, whether you have a, uh, whether you have a, a, a marketing director or some other social media of really announcing the technology you have within your practice itself. Um, internal is really around education of your patients, the education of your team, because as they tend to see these images, they'll start pushing more and start talking to their friends and family about, oh my goodness, you know, uh, not only is the service amazing, but we're actually having this ability to see things in three dimensions. But, and also lastly, around networking, as I was talking earlier, you know, when you get these, uh, we will get some facial uh, fracture cases coming from uh, plastics where They've done uh, reconstruction, but they just want to have the ability to do a follow-up x-ray and, and making sure their, their work is okay, um, as opposed to getting a traditional CT at the hospital. Even though that we have a mutual patient, they know that we have a CBCT, that we can get that for them because that's all they really need because of where that fracture was. Um, so in, in closing, um, what I want to, um, what I want to uh, really discuss and, and close with is trying to decide if the CBCT is right for you, whether you're ready for it in your practice, um, what, you want to, what you want to do with your CBCT. Are, are, you, in, are you into uh, technology? Are you, are, are you looking for something to give you the edge to do better treatment plan? And so all this in combination really needs to decide, uh, give you the information to decide um, if this is really right for you. So um, I thank you all for your time. I thank Henry Shine for giving me the opportunity to present this and my experience with CBCT in my practice. Um, hope it didn't bore y'all too much, um, but uh, I just, again, thank you all for everything. So Adam, there you go. Thank you, Dr. Mann. Great presentation. We've got a number of questions, so let's get right to them. The first one is, how does one find a radiologist to read the CBCT if needed? So you have a couple of uh, different ways. Uh, you can, uh, we do have a uh, organization that we work with, um, with our sleep apnea, because we have a provider with our sleep apnea. So they have uh, dental radiologists on staff. You can reach out to uh, some of your universities that may have dental radiologists on staff. Um, reach out. Uh, so you really want to focus in on uh, oral and maxillofacial radiology. There are some radiologies uh, at hospitals that sometimes will read them, but you really want to kind of focus in on uh, oral and maxillofacial radiologists. How do you share your DICOM files with specialists if needed? So. Uh, Primarily for, uh, for our practice, what I tend to do is we can actually burn uh, it on a CD or a USB and it actually burns a reader. It doesn't give them the ability to, uh, to uh, edit the image, but it gives them the ability to burn it, excuse me, to, to go through the image so I can call them and scan through the image with them at the same time. Um, but that's what we usually do, those two, uh, two methods. Do you use the same code on all four of the cases you presented with regards to charging for the CBCT? Yeah, so the, the code that we typically use, like I said, depending on your practice, depending on what you want to do, some practices will, uh, will use a panoramic code. Uh, other practices will use, um, I can't remember the code off the top of my head, but it's the uh, CBCT code 
that is uh, that equates to both arches without the interpretation. And so that's the code that we use uh, predominantly. Great, and it looks like we've got a comment here more so than a question, but open to your thoughts as well. Uh, she says, one of the dentists that I know is leery of reading the CBCT because of, if something is missed, they would be liable and they feel that a radiologist should read the image. Yes, and so that that is, um, I hear that quite often. And so one of the things that I would tell you is uh, go to your CEs, go get educated on this, you know, with every purchase of a CBCT, depending on the vendor that you go with, they have a lot of, um, a lot of courses to get you trained on reading these images uh, and getting comfortable with sending to radiology and knowing what to look for. And the biggest thing is looking for symmetry uh, and also getting, finding the uh, CBCT that's right for you. You know, if, if you're worried about that, maybe you're looking at a smaller field of view uh, and really concentrated. So it, it's really your comfort level at that point. All right, it looks like the last couple of questions are pertaining to your endo case. One person was asking if you could review the endo one more time. And then in addition to that, there was another attendee that says, I'm a GP, but does end but I do endo and I'm just wondering if we can buy an 11 by 10, but could still adjust it to a five by five for certain endo cases. Yeah, so the, the endo case um, that, that I had up there was, uh, was a six canal case. And we, I did not see all six canals on that PA until I got to the CBCT uh, after the fact, because that was one of my early cases that um, I really didn't uh, see the, uh, didn't pre-screen this tooth because I felt, okay, well, it's probably MB2, that was it, and I can find that. So uh, that was one of uh, my early failures in my eyes that I didn't pre-screen uh, early enough and to find that uh, those accessory canals. So now we're starting knowing this. Now we're starting to pre-screen that uh, a little bit more. Um, but that's really, uh, like I said, um, it, it just had these six canals and um, it was just baffling to me. And like I said, that was my last molar endo that I, I did. And what was that second question, Adam? Uh, it says, I am a GP, but I do endo, and I'm just wondering if we can buy a 11 by 10, but still adjust it to a 5 by 5 for certain endo cases. Yes, it, it depends on your, uh, depends on the system that you get. The one that we have can convert, and even though we have a full field of view, we can convert it for a quadrant and, uh, or, or one arch. So I do have 11 by 13. Um, and I can, I can turn to settings where I can go and take an image of just a quadrant, so yes. And you may have mentioned it, but I don't remember uh, which, uh, what brand CBCT do you have? I currently have the uh, Serona, um, the new AI, and the older version is the Galileos, but the new one is the AI. And I think they came out with a newer one since I bought this last year. Yes, I believe they have the Axios as the newer one. Uh, do you take CBCT on every patient? Yes, I do. I do. All right, that was simple. Uh, <laughs> how I so, uh, so I, I do take CBCTs on every patient, um, just because, like the 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 first pathology case that that we that we saw was she was coming down for implant placements for the lower anterior. Had we not taken a full CBCT, I potentially could not have caught the, uh, the number two failed in there. So I, I do it a lot and we do find a lot of areas that we work uh, send off to dental radiology to, uh, uh, to evaluate as well. All right, uh, question here, do you charge more than a pan or, a sa or the same? I'm assuming for a CBCT. Yeah, uh, in my practice, we since we take them on every single patient, we charge the same as a pan, uh, and a lot of times we roll it into our um, implant cases. 
the reason for that, and like I said, this is just my opinion for my practice, uh, is it gives me the ability to become a, a better diagnostician and better clinician and educate the patient. So uh, the ability to take that CBCT and to show them and educate them about why implants are important and why vital areas are important, um, it creates more ownership for that patient for them to understand why I'm proposing it and uh, our, our case closure is higher in situations like that. And I know you mentioned continuing education is always key, but what about for someone who's new to the CBCT world? Uh, do you know of any courses or online education where someone who's new to CBCT could learn how to read CBCT? Yeah, and so reaching out to the vendors, reaching out to, um, you know, just for this case is Dense Boss Rona or whoever, uh, they do put on, from what I understand, they do have uh, courses around CBCT and um, reading. And so especially if they're wanting to dabble into it, um, they, can, they can get them hooked up through those vendors. And I think this one is a piggyback off of, do you do a CBCT for every patient? The question is, how do you accommodate it in your new patient exam? And so I end up, um, and as far as the workflow, I end up taking it when we take the CBCT, it's part of our new patient exam. We take the CBCT and FMX because there's a lot of things that we see um, on the CBCT and vice versa on the FMX, especially around perio. We can, depending on the quality of the CBCT, we can see a lot of alveolar bone loss. Um, and why I like that is it's really comparing it around that FMX, but I do uh, do both, uh, uh, both images uh, for new patient flow. And this one says, how can it show the panoramic view and skull view on the software that is seen in the four frames? Uh, so how can it show that? Yes, that's what it asks. Yeah, it, and what it, what it does is the panoramic view is a rendering of the CT. So it creates that, um, that, that digital pan uh, created from the CBCT. So uh, one of the things that you'll notice once you start looking at the CBCT, if it looks like the patient was positioned too far forward or too far back, you can actually edit that to edit that pan. So that pan is purely a rendering of the CT. So if you, if you have a, um, a, 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 the jaw arch that is not uh, ideal, that's not ideal rendered, you can actually go in and edit it and adjust the panoramic view. And we just got the question, can you take a 3D scan and recreate a panoramic view from it? Yes. Yeah. Very timely. Um, do you use, again, do you use it, assuming CBCT, do you use CBCT to take external bite wings? Yes, we do. For uh, uh, Well, we have a mode on our CBCT for just the, uh, just for the external bite wings. So it's not, it's not a recreation. You're not scanning the patient for a CBCT. Uh, you can actually uh, create that mode on there where it takes the, the bite wings for you. So it would be there or. Okay. If you would take both the CBCT and full mouth scan in the same visit, how does insurance pay it? Or does the patient pay for it? And that, that we roll it into our new patient visit. Uh, it's uh, the insurance usually doesn't pay for that. We roll it in as uh, one charge. All right. And last question. Oh, maybe two more. Um, is it possible to view the 3D scan on a extension laptop computer? Yes. Um, depends on, uh, depends on what you're wanting to do. Um, so if it's just to view it you can burn it and put it to a usb drive or you if it's synced up to your um uh, to your server uh, at your location um you can view it like i could remote in from our computers and view a cbct at our practice remotely great thank you well that was a very 
good Q&A session. Lots of questions, lots of answers. Thank you everyone for asking all the questions and thank you Dr. Mann for answering them as well as your time this evening. Everyone in attendance will receive a link of the recording via email probably in the next week or so due to the holiday. If you have topics you would like us to cover in 2021 webinars, please email us at webinars at henryshine.com. We're actively working on our programming for next year. So if you have topic suggestions, we would love to hear about them. On behalf of Henry Shine, thank you again for joining us. Have a great evening and happy holidays to everyone.